I hope you don't mind me asking. You were in the war? That must have been horrible. It was hard to see civilized human beings turned into savages. But luckily, the horror was short for me. Our battalion arrived in France one month before the armistice was signed. That was most fortunate. I'm so glad. I'm not ashamed to say that I was actually eager to get into action. Our battalion was anxious to get to France before the war was over. War was to be exciting, honorable. I was so proud to lead my men into battle, I actually got the chance to teach my trainees how to use the stars to guide our night marches. Calling out the constellations one by one, eh? <laughs> Why am I not surprised? And with their perfect light, the stars serve a mighty dual purpose amidst all that mindless, deathly turmoil. Night after night, century after century, they shine with eternal peace. High in the heavens they shine, with all the thoughts and hopes and dreams of mankind. Does astronomy interest you at all? I am drawn to the poetry and the romance of the stars. Unfortunately, so much of the mystery and wonder of nature's beauty vanishes with your cold mechanical explanations. I feel that science alienates humanity from God. <clears throat> when science from creation's face, enchantment's veil withdraws, what lovely visions yield their place to cold material laws. Ah, Thomas Campbell, I see you love poetry. It's a provocative piece, but it bothers me when poets complain that scientific understanding deprives the creative imagination from dreaming up romantic explanations. Just look at the beauty of our crescent moon tonight. The Hindus have a wonderful myth about the phases of the moon. Dead souls from Earth rise to the moon, which fills with the light of their souls for the first half of the month, till it is full to the brim. India. What a fascinating poetic image. It's a comforting myth. And as the moon wanes, the same light from the departed souls is transferred to the sun. So much about the moon's phases entices poets and romantics. My favorite. But has science really robbed the heaven of its beauty? That Hindu myth about the moon transferring souls to the sun, it shows that the Hindus recognize the real reason behind the moon's phases. I mean, the simple geometric link between the moon's position and the sun's position. May I show you? When the moon and the sun are on the same side of the sky, the moon is nearly empty in its crescent phase. But as the moon moves across to the opposite side, it slowly filled with the light of the breath till it is full to the brim. The, the mythical explanation is poetic for sure, but, but it keeps track of the relative position of the moon and the sun. The geometry is scientifically correct. You weave the human struggle, the thrill, discovery, the lure, and the romance of astronomy all together. And Grace, may I call you Grace? Edwin. Where there is beauty, there is God. Science brings me closer to God. You do know how to uplift the woman's soul. But will your astronomy help us with our desire for a purpose to the universe? I do believe astronomy can lead to deep cosmological implications. I think it is the purpose of the cosmos to develop the human mind to penetrate the ultimate beauty, the ultimate rationality of the universe. And so to appreciate God and his beautiful creation to the fullest extent of our understanding. How profound. Huxley? <laughs> no. Hubble. <laughs> so, Mr. Hubble, are you ready for the grueling hours to lead you to your nirvana? I can't wait to get my chance at the hundred inch. I will lead an all-out attack on those spirals. Spoken like a major going into battle. But for now, my hopes are doomed. The top astronomers here won't let me near their best telescope. It makes me angry inside. Hope has two daughters, anger and courage. Anger to see things the way they are, and courage to make things the way they ought to be. That's uplifting. Who said that? St. Augustine. And what do you hope to find? Through the 100 inch, every spiral nebula will turn into a fantastic galaxy filled with millions of stars, each as majestic as our Milky Way. Dear Hubble, 
deep in my heart, I am sure that the world will step aside for a man who knows where he is going. And grace saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now show me your constellations. shakes the world of physics again. Gravity is not a force. It is the bending of the elastic fabric of space-time in the presence of mass. The mass of the sun bends starlight. British scientists confirm Einstein's predictions. I trust your long train ride with your opponent was not too contentious. Oh, amicable, actually. But tomorrow he's coming at me with hammer and tongs. Your king is ready for battle, as always. I sense some apprehension about your historic debate tomorrow. I have a lively sense that we are on the threshold of great things. The universe will grow before our eyes. I am worried about our famous guest. Where is he? Professor Einstein, ah. Professor Einstein. We say your theory of relativity in one sentence. What do you think about Hitler? What do you think about Hitler? Professor Einstein. Thank you for inviting me. Our team is truly delighted to host this banquet in your honor. The reports confirming your amazing predictions about the bending of light due to the gravity of the sun are sensational. I am just happy that the intimate connection between the beautiful, the true, and the real has once again been proved. <laughs> I cannot help but ask, how would you have reacted if the pivotal eclipse experiment had failed to confirm your predictions for the bending of light? Then I would feel sorry for the good Lord, <laughs> for the theory is correct. <laughs> <laughs> With respect, do you truly believe that your geometric theory of gravity has such a grand reach? Oh, indeed. It is pregnant with cosmological implications for the size and shape of the universe. We are up to the size of the universe as well. We're tracking Cepheid variables in the nebulae and red shifts. We find that I am that not when interested in this or that detail. I, I want to know how the good Lord created this world. Mm. I want to know his thoughts. Do you truly believe that a human being can ever read the mind of God? What can I tell you that you cannot tell yourself? I have complete faith that God's universe is comprehensible to reason. <laughs> I was surprised by how much the press seems to understand your second revolution. Overthrowing Newton's ideas with your geometric theory of the bending of light? You have become an overnight celebrity. In the immortal verse of Omar Khayyam, one thing is certain, and the rest debate. Light rays when near the sun do not go straight. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you celebrate your victory after the eclipse report? I bought a new violin. <laughs> <laughs> now I would like a glass of red wine, please. Uh, unfortunately, Professor Einstein, our country has descended into the dark abyss of purity. The temperance movement proclaims alcohol as the root of all debauchery and evil. What a pity. Well, let us see now if a perfect world will materialize. <laughs> I must take this opportunity to invite you to Mount Wilson. Through our 100 inch telescope, we'll show you the real universe behind your complex equation. For sure, for sure. With my next visit to America, I will bring Elsa. She has been after me for years. She too wants to see the stars. But in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I want to apologize for keeping tomorrow's debate away from your favorite topic. Relativity tends to scare the general audience. So much of it defies common sense. Common sense is nearly 
the collection of prejudices acquired by the age of 18. <laughs> but don't you have a difficult time explaining relativity? Oh, on the contrary, it is quite simple. If I were to place my head on a hot stove for a minute, it would feel like an hour. But if I were to sit talking with a pretty girl for an hour, it would feel like a minute. <laughs> so you see, time is relative. <laughs> ah, such a pity you will have to miss our exciting event tomorrow. We are going to be debating the true size of our universe. Shapley here is ready to pronounce that our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, it must be our entire universe. You have measured the size of the universe. Fantastic. And how big is it? Even though light travels at an incredible speed of a billion miles per hour, light still takes over 300,000 years to cross the Milky Way. That's longer than the times Homo sapiens have inhabited the Earth. Indeed, tomorrow I'm ready to pronounce that our galaxy is so huge that it encompasses absolutely everything. The celestial vastness is truly astounding. But that's not all. I have an even bigger surprise. I've dethroned our sun from the center of the universe. I've located our sun at the outer periphery of the Milky Way. Our sun, our planet Earth, we humans have all become peripheral. Shocking that God would place us anywhere but at the center of his universe. We are his creations, are we not? The first man ever, back in the Stone Age, who downed the woolly mammoth with his club or saw his reflection in the water, became suddenly conceited. From there evolved the first egotistical thought, I am the center of the universe. <laughs> this has been our heritage for thousands of years. Yes, we have been misled and victimized by tradition that we are God's appointed, right in the thick of things. Scientifically, this is simply not the case. It's time you Bible thumpers woke up to the real truth. Real truth. How presumptuous. And your accusation is baseless. The Bible makes no claim to the centrality of the earth. However, as a religious person, I still believe that God is at the center of my universe. So while I do trust your dramatic scientific discoveries, I am not at all disturbed by them. You are a new Copernicus. <laughs> he once dethroned our Earth from the center of the known universe, and now you have dethroned the Sun from the center of the galaxy. Personally, I am glad to see humanity shrink to such physical nothingness. It is important and wholesome for human beings to realize what little importance they have in comparison to the vastness of the universe. If I may interrupt, I believe the universe is even vaster. Ah, even bigger. Wonderful. I'm not surprised. <laughs> but what makes you say this? Professor Shapley completely neglects the fantastic speed at which the nebulae are flying away from us. It is only logical that such fast-moving nebula move far outside our Milky Way. It also explains why they are so very faint. They must be far, so far, that it may take more than, it may take light, more than, say, one million years to come to us. In which case, Shapley's 300,000 light year galaxy is next to nothing. Professor Einstein, I fear you're hearing a lot of nebulosity from our novice, <laughs> if you'll excuse the intended pun. Our galaxy may be one galaxy in a vast panorama of galaxies. The true size of the universe will remain a mystery until we can measure the distances to those nebulae. I personally believe that Andromeda will be our best bet. This is precisely a task for a young astronomer like yourself, then, is it not? <laughs> Foolish amateur speculation. I'm afraid, I'm afraid Hubble's plurality of universes exists only in poetry. 